I do believe that when future historians look back on the Obama era, they will identify his precipitous flight, his hasty retreat from Iraq, as his number one strategic blunder, foreign policy blunder. And that's saying something. We created a power vacuum. It was filled by the jihadis and the haters, and the entire region is degenerating into what will be a multi-year civil war on multiple levels, a tragedy. So it's not like if we just flipped a switch and did X, Y, or Z, the terrorist threat in Iraq would go away. That's just not how, the re that's not how it works. So we're helping them build their capability. We're helping provide them with the tools, the guidance, the assistance as they fight this fight. But it's really uh, up to them. We're getting reports on the ground in Iraq as you take a look at a map of that country where U.S. troops are no longer on the ground, that the cities of Ramadi and Fallujah are under siege, that militants tied to al-Qaeda, carrying the black flag synonymous with al-Qaeda, uh, are fighting for those cities, setting fire to police stations, releasing extremists from jail, and in some parts of those cities, they are in control in western of Iraq of those places, places that a lot of U.S. soldiers and Marines died so that Iraqis uh, could control those places. What about this rise of al-Qaeda in Iraq and all over the region? Let's bring in our panel. Steve Hayes, senior writer for the Weekly Standard. We welcome Elise Vibak, staff writer for The Hill and syndicated columnist Charles Krauthammer. Okay, Steve. Well, I think what is particularly discouraging is the fact that the United States fought so hard in those, those towns and others in western Iraq to win uh, freedom for the Iraqis alongside Iraqis, alongside Sunni tribes, and that now that's basically gone. Uh, what we saw over the last couple of days is really just the culmination of a long buildup of fighting from the current version of al-Qaeda in Iraq. And you'd had a series of, of complex suicide bombings leading up to this. There were some two dozen suicide bombings in October in western Iraq uh, by this group, uh, according to Long War Journal, which is really the authoritative subject on these matters. Um, and so it's basically been a long series. This has basically been coming for quite a while. Elise, is there a sense that uh, the administration is dealing with this in any way, shape, or form, pressuring the Iraqis in any way? Is Capitol Hill engaged on this? Well, certainly the administration is quietly sending many weapons to the Iraqi government in order to combat this rising tide of al-Qaeda in the West. But uh, there's bipartisan opposition on Capitol Hill and skepticism, frankly, about President Obama's approach to handling his relationship with, prime, with the Iraqi Prime Minister al-Maliki. They don't think that Obama has been vocal enough in telling al-Maliki not to alienate his Sunni opposition, which is creating civil unrest, which is not, you know, the foundation that we need in order to ensure stability in Iraq. Take a listen to this back and forth with the State Department spokeswoman. Uh, the, the question was about the status of forces agreement uh, back in 2011 and whether the administration really wanted to sign this deal back then uh, with the Iraqis, which essentially would have drawn down U.S. troops gradually as opposed to pulling them out immediately. I'm not asking you to relitigate it. Was the administration not interested in concluding a SOFA with the Iraqi government? I'm just not going to go back down that road. I don't. Well, I, the answer is yes, okay, and I don't see why do you, you want can't my say, job. Then you want to answer? No, but I would prefer that you not try to sidestep. I mean, it's a. I'm pretty, not trying to sidestep, but we're yeah, focused you, on 2014 and where we go from here. A discussion or debate about what question, we may or may not have question was, about what we may respond, or may not have wanted in his, 2011 oh, is not relevant to, dis, to the discussion today, Matt. It's, it's completely just completely relevant to the question that I he disagree. asked, which was that critics. His question was. Critics suggest or say, claim, accuse the administration of abandoning Iraq. And I disagree with the premise. Charles, what about that? Look, here's why the history is crucial. The reason that Maliki does not listen to Obama, no matter what he says about reconciling with the Sunnis, is because America has no leverage. America evacuated. Obama decided we were going to liquidate our presence. We were supposed to negotiate a status of forces agreement and to leave a residual element in Iraq that would train the Air Force, that would train the Army, that would also have special forces on the ground that would go on operations, and that perhaps the most important would mediate between the Sunnis and the Shiites and the Kurds as it had been doing during the surge. Instead, 
Obama decided for political reasons that he would evacuate. He'd call it a great victory. He ended the war, but he ended the war in a way that liquidated our gains. The war was won when Obama came into office. Al-Qaeda was completely decimated. The Anbar Sunnis, who are now under attack, had turned against Al-Qaeda, joined the infidel, us, in defeating Al-Qaeda, and al-Maliki had taken all, all the extremist Shiites in Basra and all the way up into Baghdad as a demonstration of how he was a nationalist and not just a sectarian. All of this was happening. What we needed was an agreement and a presence. Obama liquidated it, and as a result, he has created a vacuum which Iran has come in, Al-Qaeda is strong, not only now in Iraq, but also in Syria, and it is a catastrophe. A lot of activity on Bing, an agreement there with you, Charles, and as you take a look at some of these questions, will militants take over significant portions of Iraq? Yes, 98 uh, percent across the board there. Will militants erase democratic gains made during the Iraq war? 95 percent. But this is a tougher question. Your feeling about U.S. involvement in the Iraq war, it was a mistake, 41 percent. It was worth the cost, 51 percent. No feeling at all, 8%. It's a tough question, uh, Elise, and one that you know lawmakers obviously deal with as they look towards now Afghanistan and the dealings with uh, the Karzai government and setting up a status of forces agreement there. That's exactly right. And in fact, Senator John McCain, who's one of our leading voices on these issues, was in Afghanistan this week meeting with Hamid Karzai to talk about the potential agreement, which they hoped would be signed by New Year's Day. It was not. And they're hoping to make progress on that in the next week or so. In fact, John McCain came out and said very strongly that he feels that they are in the final stage of negotiations. And I think that the current status of security in Iraq is a major warning for Hamid Karzai because he does not want to see the security of his state devolve in the same way. He wants to make sure that the U.S. troops can maintain their presence there in order to uh, maintain the stability. But is this the same thing that's developing here? Is, is the administration really sending the signal that while they're saying they want to do this deal with Karzai, in reality, they don't? Yeah, of course. I mean, and it goes far beyond these talks of specific agreements with either Karzai or the Iraqis, and it goes with the, the message that we're sending to the entire region. We don't want to be involved. The president has made that abundantly clear, and the idea that the United States is going to be there for Hamid Karzai or his successor, I think, has to be seen by uh, folks in Afghanistan, leadership in Afghanistan, as, as uh, highly unlikely. I think if you go back and look at the history of this even further as it relates to President Obama, that's where you begin to see the split. Remember, back in 2002, he called Iraq the dumb war. He built his career on opposing fighting in Iraq. And it was very clear from the moment that he uh, took the Oval Office that he considered, he, he continued to consider Iraq the dumb war. Now, a true leader, I think, would have then said, I don't care what I thought about it then. We need to consolidate our victory here and focus on winning the war rather than just ending it. But he very clearly opted not to do that. I think he sent those signals almost immediately upon taking office and, by contrast, <clears throat> surged forces to Afghanistan. Although, didn't talk a lot about Afghanistan either. He didn't say a word about it. And right now, I, mem I remember seeing a poll, I think it was last week, where the support for the Afghan war is the lowest of any war perhaps in American history, I mean, uh, as long as we've actually had polls. And the reason is Americans don't like wars, and they shouldn't. They'll only support a war, starting with FDR, or, I mean, all the way up until today, if the president will go out and explain why and make a case. He never did, and three out of every four dead in Afghanistan, American dead, has occurred under Obama in a war in which he never supported, and he essentially abandoned even as it was going on. Next up, the Friday Lightning Round. 